Um, and then the speakers will introduce themselves and their programs, and then we'll move into the discussion uh, portion of the panel. Uh, so first off, um, Haim Koff, our moderator for this panel, is a certified energy manager with over 10 years of energy efficiency financing experience. His expertise focuses on developing innovative energy retrofit projects through positive customer experiences. He has managed over 30 million in financing projects and is currently working on a pipeline of new exciting projects through the City of Toronto Energy Retrofit Loan Program. Jonathan Frank serves as head of clean energy at Ban City Community Investment Bank and is involved in all aspects of project financing. John has been involved in a wide range of clean energy technologies across Canada that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and generate strong financial returns, including solar and wind energy, energy efficiency retrofits, geothermal, bioenergy, combined heat and power, and energy storage. Jamie Shipley has 30 years of experience in the residential construction industry, including over 25 years with CMHC. Jamie's role at CMHC includes promoting the creation of sustainable, affordable housing and delivering on the national housing strategy. Jamie shares technical and social economic information about aging in place and affordable housing programs with builders, developers, renovators, planners, and housing design professionals across Ontario. Jen is the lead of sustainable housing at FCM. She led the design of the uh, sustainable affordable housing funding offer and now focuses on effective program opera, opera, operationalization and continuous improvement and strategic partnerships. Jen's experience encompasses all facets of improving affordable housing opportunities. Prior to joining FCM, Jen led the design and implementation of the City of Calgary's affordable housing strategy. Uh, Chandra Ramadurai is the CEO of Efficiency Capital. He brings over two decades of experience in clean energy, banking and investment management in Canada the US, Europe, and Middle East and India. During his tenure, Efficiency Capital has grown from a startup to one of Canada's fastest growing companies as selected by Globe and Mail's recent top growing companies report. He is also the recipient of Canada's Clean 50 Award in 2021. Welcome panel. Over to you, Haim. Okay, good morning everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the way this panel will work is that we're going to do a quick overview of our specific programs and initiatives, and then we're going to turn it over to some questions and answers where we'll have an opportunity to, um, well, I'll have the opportunity actually to ask the panel some questions, and we'll get their answers. Um, and then we're going to open up the floor uh, for any of the attendees to ask any questions. And you know, through the course of this presentation, please feel free to add your own comments to the chat. Um, and we'll get back to them um, once we've finished this initial uh, summary of our program. So I'll just lead off um, with the with uh, my program. So I just a little bit about the Better Buildings Partnership is it's the city's um, um, support building support program for energy efficiency and decarbonization. Um, so if we could just move to the next slide. Um, a little bit about the reason why we're doing this is because the city does have a 2040 net zero goal um, and it includes different and we've We've actually introduced a net zero building strategy, including many different um, strategies and recommendations for enabling these buildings um, to, to improve um, and without going through them we're going to just move on to the next slide. Um, so specifically within um, those nine strategies, we focused on three different programs that we offer. Um, one is a navigation and support services program, which is a basic um, identification of projects. Um, we'll, we'll work with the building owner to really to identify the projects, and then we'll try to find other sources of funding or partners, um, which could include FCM, CMHC, Efficiency Capital, um, really trying to drive the project forward. We also have our own capital program, the Energy Retrofit Loans Program, that provides funding. Um, some of the elements of the program are that the funds are advanced in the 
at the project start and financing is available for up to 100% of the project cost. Um, I would just rec um, just because of our audience today is not necessarily specific to the city of Toronto. Um, this program is only available uh, to those in the 416. Um, and then our final program that I wanted to introduce here is our deep retrofit challenge. And this is really targeting that those buildings that are doing large, very significant um, Im improvements to their building um, and decarbonization to their building because these are, we're looking for almost, um, or anywhere from 50 to 80% um, carbon and energy savings um, in the buildings, but the grant that we're offering um, is up to $500,000 per building. So it's a very significant grant to enable you to move your project forward. Um, and with that, I think we'll turn this over to Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be here with you. Uh, thank you, Efficiency Capital, for putting on this uh, really interesting event. Um, so briefly, I'll just describe a bit about who Van City Community Investment Bank is and um, what our role is in the retrofit market. So we are a Schedule One Canadian bank. Uh, we're the only, the first and only bank in Canada that's entirely focused on partnering with organizations that are driving uh, social, economic, and environmental change. We do that across real estate financing, business lending, and the team I'm on, which is clean energy finance. On the clean energy side, we, um, we serve a, a whole bunch of different technologies and different business models and uh, different jurisdictions across, the can across Canada. Um, Van City, you may know more so as the credit union based in Vancouver. It's Canada's largest credit union, over 30 billion of assets under management and administration, and a 75 year history of being a values based leader. We're also the um, uh, have a 2040 net zero lending portfolio target, which is a full decade ahead of any other financial institution in Canada. And we see retrofitting of, um, of real estate as a, a core element of achieving those goals. Uh, next slide, please. So on our project finance side, um, we're able to finance um, building retrofits, um, both deep and uh, specific technologies. We've done solar, geo exchange, battery energy storage, as well as multi-measure retrofits across water, electricity, and gas measures. Um, we can come in at construction financing. So for projects that are shovel ready, we can come in alongside equity or other grant funding and provide the financing needed to get uh, a project built or ret retrofit uh, finished. We can also provide short-term and bridge financing. Sometimes this is effective if you're looking to uh, retrofit a, a, a number of buildings and, and then once all are completed to refinance um, as a larger loan. Um, the most common type of financing we do is long-term financing. So in this case, um, in the context of a retrofit project, um, you could finance um, uh, that project over a you know, 20 year lifespan, so 20 year amortization. Um, and then we can also support on bill financing structures or PACE structures, PACE is property assessed clean energy. We're currently working with the city of Ottawa on their Better Homes Loan Program and, um, and see PACE as an interesting approach to financing retrofits across both residential and commercial properties in Canada. Generally speaking, our loan sizes start around 3 million and go up to 50 million or more. That can be for a single project or a portfolio. And we can often provide up to 60 to 80% of project capital costs uh, in the form of a senior loan. In some cases, we can do 100% financing. One example was a geo exchange uh, project for a new build townhouse complex where um, we provided the financing so that the condo corporation could purchase the geo system from the condo developer and thereby own and own their own heating and cooling system. Our rates are competitive, but certainly dependent on the project's risk profile. And we have quite a bit of flexibility in, in our term. So we can do uh, fixed rate terms from two to 15 years and amortizations up to 30 years. Um, next slide, please. When it comes to energy efficiency retrofitting, we generally see two types of structures. And this really comes down to the, the business model or the right sort of um, structure and solution for each individual building owner. The one on the left is the more typical ESCO style financing where VCIB would provide a loan directly to the building owner in order to pay uh, an energy performance contractor to complete an energy retrofit. 
in the case of most ESCO type projects, that uh, energy performance contractor is providing some form of guarantee on the savings, passing that through to the building owner in the case of shortfalls, which can be used to help service the loan to VCIB. In this context, we can also include financing for other types of upgrades across the building, not just uh, limited to the uh, energy performance contractor's scope of work. The indirect financing model um, on the right side of the slide is, is more akin to um, you know, what you heard Matt describing earlier around the energy savings performance agreement and the shared savings model. In this case, we would provide the loan directly to the uh, energy service, um, uh, uh, the energy service savings performance agreement. In most cases, that's a special purpose company set up. But in this case, you can almost imagine it as, as efficiency capital. And so the loan goes to, um, to that service provider and then they're um, servicing that debt with us. So in this case, we're a step removed from the building owner and the, um, the ESPA provider is sort of the one-stop solution. And, and we've seen both these models be effective. It really depends on the case and context for the building owner. Next slide, please. Uh, briefly, I'll just describe this, um, this case study. So this model was um, the ESPA model. So on the right side of the last screen. So we provided a loan to an energy service company that then provided a shared savings retrofit solution to, um, to the end uh, building owner. In this case, it was a 1980s multifamily residential building, but 15 stories, 190 units. And the retrofit um, was about $640,000 and it replaced um, uh, makeup air units, uh, installed a condensing hot water boiler, high efficiency toilets and low flow shower heads retrofitted the common area lighting and added insulation to select piping and decommissioning some redundant equipment. Uh, interestingly, the, the water savings is one of the, the more, more significant factors in the uh, overall payback here. Um, you can see the before and after um, uh, in, in the stats there around uh, utility cost savings and the GHG reductions. Uh, interestingly, this project was one of the first to receive the Investor Ready Energy Efficiency Certification through the Canadian Green Building Council and, and GBI. Uh, in this case, that meant that the project was verified, the energy savings was verified by a third party, um, which is a, a nice sort of value add to the building owner to confirm that these savings will be realized. And Efficiency Capital also has experience um, with this certification. Um, I think that's the last slide, but I'll just um, sort of close by saying that, um, you know, our team has a, a wide range of experience across multiple technologies. We can support our clients across multiple business models. And uh, it's our mission to use the tools of finance to help our clients reduce carbon emissions and create a more sustainable tomorrow. So I'd love to work with you on your next project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Jamie Shipley from CMHC. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here again uh, on this panel to speak to you about what CMHC has to offer. And I didn't create a, bu a bunch of slides because I, I did know that Matt was going to talk about um, some of our programs that are available for you. These programs are not new, they've been around. So I didn't want to spend a lot of time on them, but thank, thank you, Matt, for highlighting the Seed and Preservation Fund and the uh, Co-Investment uh, Fund is also another key. I, I do have an update to give you on the Co-Investment, but that's also another key. But a key program for assisting with, um, this is our goal. Um, we're driven by one goal and that's housing affordability for all by, by 2030, uh, having all Canadians that have a home that they can afford and meets their needs is our, our aspirational goal still is. And we're working hard towards that goal. Um, some of the stuff you heard uh, from Matt is part of it. There, there's, there's much more to this strategy. Uh, you hear in the news uh, the housing crisis across across the country. We're, you know, we're working hard to to get on top of a lot of the problems that are happening. We do know that uh, housing supply is a is a critical a critical issue in this country, and we're working on. We have uh, I'm not going to talk about it today, but we also have you know have a strategy around helping increase housing supply as well. So many many moving parts um, to CMHC and delivering on the national housing strategy, but. Uh, for today, I just wanted to take a few minutes to highlight uh, some, some of our priorities that, that uh, as we go through the strategy and we do evaluate the strategy on an ongoing basis, and we do report back to Parliament on the success of the strategy, which started in 2017 or 18. So it's, you know, it's three, four, year, four years in now. 
Um, so we do have, we, we are paying attention. We do know what's working well and what's not, and we're making changes and we're making adjustments. Uh, that's some of the stuff that you saw from Matt introducing the new MOI select uh, commercial product that we have for, for all lenders, for anybody just that's just looking to insure their mortgage, it, putting back a focus a focus on on climate, uh, get, getting, you know, becoming, be, putting it almost on equal footing to the affordability uh, criteria that we have equal, you know, putting equal uh, emphasis on on doing a better job of reducing our our uh, carbon footprint and our and, and protecting our environment. So that was an important change. Uh, our priority, we do, we do some, one thing that we do know is, has not been as big an uptake that we were hoping, and that is the, the retrofit of existing buildings that, you know, part of this strategy, uh, on increasing supply is of course, creating new, but also looking after what the existing buildings that we have. And a lot of them, uh, I'm talking Mertz here. I'm not talking single family. I'm focusing on the multiple unit, uh, buildings. They're, they're not very energy efficient built in a time, you know, when energy efficiency was not for, you know, for, foremost on our mind. So we do know there's a challenge there. We'd like to see more uptake in, in the funds that we have available in the co-investment repair. Uh, we are introducing a, uh, not introducing, it's not a new program, it's an existing program on a contribution only. One of the things we're going to try this year is promoting more uh, to proponents of going to coming to CMHC for just a contribution, not necessarily, you know, they can still come for the mortgage for the whole program, but on the contribution side, you can receive, you know, depending on your project, you can receive a letter of intent from us to, to provide a contribution only, meaning uh, no, we don't, no security on it. It's a contribution uh, that's good for six months that, that, that uh, up and can be up to 40% of the project costs depending, you know, evaluating what it is that, that you're doing. Well, basically getting that letter of intent from us that you can take to lenders and you've seen other funding uh, possibilities uh, in this session to, to make up, I call it gap funding or just, just where we don't have enough and we, it, it helps fill those uh, areas. We're big on partnerships at CMHC. So this is a way to, to have that letter of intent from the federal government. Uh, should increase the uh, the chances of you obtaining other funding and finding other partners. And that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for partnerships. We're looking for uh, other levels of government to get involved. And we're looking to not only retrofit existing, but build new units. And that's uh, the big solution that we're focusing on to uh, help with the affordability crisis uh, in this country. So I'll just, I'll just want to just quickly leave it at that. Uh, we can, as we go, we'll talk more about, uh, the stuff that CMHC has to offer, but thank you. Hi everyone. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, the Green Municipal Fund, and specifically the Sustainable Affordable Housing Initiative. So next slide, please. Perfect. So the Sustainable Affordable Housing Initiative is a $300 million funding offer of FCM's Green Municipal Fund. It's aimed at supporting and incentivizing energy efficiency in affordable housing projects. The table on this slide outlines basically everything that we, we have to offer. I'm not going to go through all the details, just highlight a couple of things for you here. We've intentionally offered funding at every stage of a project from its very early inception with our planning grants, which offer a simple and fast application process and are intended to help get your energy efficiency retrofit off the ground to studies which support more detailed planning pre-construction like level two ASH rate audits through to construction supported by our capital project financing. For retrofits, our funding is intended to support providers in striving for deeper energy savings. So our capital financing offers a combination of grants and loans, and the grant portion is actually tied to the anticipated energy savings in a project, starting at 25% and up to 50%. So if a project anticipates a 25% reduction in energy use, it will receive a 25% grant, a 30% savings will give you a 30% grant and so on up to 50%. The grants are locked in upfront and will not change when the retrofit is completed. And the terms of our funding are 10, 20 or 30 years. Next slide, please. 
We also focus on developing the capacity of the affordable housing sector to undertake energy efficient projects with a number of resources on our website and initiatives underway, including a peer learning community of practice for early stage retrofit projects. A key pillar of this work I wanted to highlight here today is our Regional Energy Coach Pilot, which is being delivered in partnership with the BC Nonprofit Housing Association, the Community Housing Transformation Center, and the Cooperative Housing Federation of Canada. Through this program, we offer free services to help providers initiate an energy efficient retrofit project with walkthrough energy assessments, support identifying consultants or energy experts, or help identifying and applying to funding, and much more. So I'm looking forward to, to digging into all of this further in our discussion. Hello, everyone. I'm Chandra from Efficiency Capital. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about what we do uh, and some of the benefits we see from the retrofits we undertake. Um, and then uh, we can get into the discussion. Uh, uh, next slide, please. In terms of what we do, I would like to basically start by telling you a little bit about why we started doing what we are doing. Um, I think uh, I'm talking about a time more than 10 years ago uh, when TAV and BOMA partnered and did a study. Um, and the study basically was to identify uh, why buildings were not undertaking retrofits. Clearly, you, you would think that something which will reduce your energy cost and your monthly bill by 20-30% is something which would be attractive, but a lot of people are not doing that. And, and, and the reality is, even after 10 years, it still continues to be the case. And the three major barriers identified were capital. And when I say capital, it's not just uh, availability of capital. Even if you have the capital, the question is, what do you do with it? Do you go and upgrade your lobbies or, or your balconies? Or do you basically go and replace your boilers, which are very inefficient? So that's the biggest challenge on one aspect. And that dives straight into the second major barrier, which is risk. And when I say risk, it's not, um, it, it's the risk of something working. Like, you know, you've been told that you're going to save $100,000. Are you actually saving this hundred thousand dollars? Can you really pay back your loan from the savings generated, or is it only generating fifty thousand dollars? How do you make sure that it works? Uh, especially, let's say this winter is much more harsher than the previous one. Your baseline has changed. Uh, not to mention, there are also we there have been unfortunately we, the industry is replete with a lot of broken promises. I'm sure many of you here have actually had experience of this. Um, so that's the risk piece. So especially when risk becomes an, uh, a component of it, capital doesn't flow enough. And the final piece is capacity. I also saw an audience question earlier on today saying, what does capacity mean? Can you expand on it? I mean, to us, capacity is the capacity to execute. Uh, most buildings, uh, especially the MOPs, are managed by a voluntary board with one property manager. Uh, and the property manager is almost always fully occupied. So the chances of them having to think through a proper energy retrofit and being able to execute it is always very difficult. So that's, that's so you, yeah, when, when seven your boiler breaks, you're going to look at fixing it, but that's typically what. So the idea was you have to solve these three barriers for you to solve the retrofit problem. So that's where this whole program came about. Um, the investment solution, which was originally developed by TAF, but which we completely work on. So how does that work? So we go and invest the capital. That's how we solve the capital problem. Uh, we, uh, like, you know, we invest both the debt and the equity piece, and, and we can work with a variety of sources, as Matt has alluded to, as mentioned multiple times. Uh, we can go and get arranged debt from Van Stree, or take grant funding from FCM, or take a CMHC loan, that's typically the debt. We take it in our books rather than in your books. And that's the indirect method, which Jonathan was, men uh, was mentioning earlier about. And then we add that 20%, 30%, whatever equity is needed, and we put the 100% of the capital. Then we basically, once the money is arranged, then you need to basically get into the, uh, the risk piece. How do you manage the risk of something working? 
So we basically create, like, you know, we, we come up with baseline studies. We'll tell you, you're going to save $100,000. And we tell you that if you don't save $100,000, you don't pay us, you pay us lower. So, so that's the risk piece. So we take away the complete risk. If you, if you save zero, you pay me zero. That's typically how that arrangement works. And the final piece is capacity. And the capacity piece is where we basically, because we get paid on performance, we always have to make sure that the best equipment are used and they are going to work for the long term because our typical contracts with you are 10, 15, 20 years. So because of this, we need to make sure that it works fine. So we end up choosing the right uh, equipment. You always have a say in how it is all done. Um, so this is typically how we solve the problem. One of the things we realized as we, uh, as we go, went through these investments um, is a need for people to talk to uh, others. So that's where we introduced a new concept called retrofit concierge. And uh, the concierge is basically an advisory thing. Uh, we basically give you as much advice as possible in terms of ability to retrofit. And then we enable you to find different funding sources as required. So that's in summary what we do. I will quickly touch base on the track record. I, I saw ESPA being used multiple times. I'm very happy because ESPA is a trademark name which can only be used by us, uh, Efficiency Capital and TAF. Uh, the ESPA stands for Energy Savings Performance Agreement. Um, and uh, using this methodology, we have done over 55 installations. We have saved over $30 million. Okay, and you can see the amount of water savings, $2 billion uh, liters of water, 250,000 tons, sorry, 25,000 tons of greenhouse gases, gas saved, and so on and so forth. So clearly there is a strong financial benefit and the environmental benefit. But the one thing we always forget about is the social benefit, which I will briefly touch upon in the next slide. So this is actually a measurement done on a specific project, which was undertaken using this ESPA methodology by TAF. Um, and this was a pre and post retrofit measurement. You can see the picture at the bottom you can see the this one. This is the a picture of the duct before the retrofit and after the retrofit. Now you can understand why all these problems were happening. You can see why there was no not enough thermal comfort. Why there are complaints about extreme heat. Uh, you are talking about situations where uh, there are significant reductions to doctors uh, because of improved fresh air supply. People could have uh, like a significant. Uh, 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 like you know, a decrease in order complaints. So there are a bunch of things which actually happen, which a lot of people don't measure. And that's one thing we do whenever we work, especially in the not-for-profit sector or, or in the condo space, we do these measurements in addition to the environmental and the financial measurements. With this, I will turn it back to Haim uh, so that we move into the questions phase. I'm you're muted. My apologies. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chandra. Um, just building off what Chandra just, you know, finished or concluded talking about, and how um, retrofits in buildings are not only about energy; they're also about social benefits. I thought, like, a good question to get us started would be about. Um, how or what do you consider when you're deciding uh, multi-unit residential retrofits? Should the focus be, um, or why do we this? Why why is sustainability, GHG, energy such an important factor um, in considering all of these different retrofits? Um, and I think this also aligns with one of the questions I saw in the chat a few minutes ago around ventilation and how important it is to consider other elements within the building. So if I could turn it over to the panel, really to give us your own personal views, and even though I did put some answers. On the, on the panel, but feel free to add your own. Um, it is, what do you think is important when considering retrofit and especially really focusing on those GHG and energy efficiency elements? So any volunteers? Uh, happy to jump in. Um, I agree with the, the ones you have on the slide there. Um, the, the energy cost savings are obviously a big one. Um, and as a mission driven lender for us, the GHG reductions are really critical. So we look for, for both the cost savings and the GHG reductions. Um, in addition to the improvement 
um, of the building for residents, I think there's an element here where low cost financing can come in, um, where we can start to sort of multi-solve both climate um, and, uh, and affordability issues. So I think that, that'd be one I'd add in here is the, the affordability. If we can reduce energy costs, um, we can hopefully also start to, uh, to couple that with um, affordability improvements. Yeah. Maybe I can uh, just piggyback off that um, briefly because um, we did some work with the um, Canadian Urban Sustainability Practitioners Network around energy poverty specifically. So in terms of the opportunities for affordability, I, I was really um, quite surprised to see how many uh, individuals living in non-market housing actually were in energy poverty. Um, and when you look at those that are responsible for paying energy bills and are in energy poverty, and that we've measured at paying more than 6% of their uh, after-tax income on energy, um, the national average is 3%. 37% of individuals who are paying their utilities living in non-market housing are in energy poverty. So, you know, this is a sector that I know is extremely concerned uh, on affordability. It's mission driven around making affordable homes for individuals, and there's a, a lot of opportunity there. So, there's opportunity for savings, um, kind of either way in terms of who's who's paying the utilities. But in the cases where residents are responsible, there's a real opportunity. Um, for savings. And we did go through some of it in the chat, but there's a lot of, of health impacts in a changing climate. I think one thing I may want to just highlight that I did put in the chat um, is, uh, you know, a lot of these buildings are older, were maybe built without air conditioning. Uh, and in a changing climate, that is becoming a, a real serious health risk. And when you are able to undertake uh, a retrofit in an efficient way, you can add cooling and still see cost savings overall. So you know, there's there's so many reasons that this is important, but just wanted to highlight those two. Yeah, I would like to just uh, jump in and uh, address that affordability piece uh, as well. Um, I think uh, what people don't realize is how much energy costs and water costs have been increasing over time. I mean, if you look at the 40 year average, there has been a 4% increase in energy cost every, every year compounded 4%. Uh, over the last 40 years. Water has been increasing by over 8%. And gas obviously uh, was one of the outliers, but in the last 12 months, and thanks, the, especially in the last three months, thanks to the what's happening across the world, um, it's been, gas prices have been going up in, in a big way. So people have started taking notice of a lot of these aspects. And the good part is, sustainability and energy or cost reductions are intricately linked. Uh, there is, uh, the, the moment you save energy, you save GHG. There is no, there are no two ways about it. You, you, uh, so, so you, by doing, uh, by doing good to yourself, you're doing good to the world. Uh, no, um, Sandra, I would just like chime in. It's a great, you know, it's really important what you brought forward around gas costs, how that's always been, you know, the lowest cost energy, and it's not been a focus. Um, but when, when you look at the, the, the consistent increase to gas costs, plus you add in the, you know, the federal climate, climate impact, like the costs or the, or the carbon charges for um, gas, suddenly the business case is starting to come forward for electrification of buildings, adding heat pumps, looking at these um, wellness objectives for your building, and it's making the business case come alive. Um, so we're seeing that, and, um, and it, it's just something that you have to work through with your own individual building, um, but it is starting to come forward. Um, Jamie, did I'll you just, have, Yeah, yeah I'll just verify with, with, so, you know, with, with the CMHC programs, all of them, they all of them from start to finish. The, uh, we all, one of our social outcomes, of course, is, is energy and all our programs require a reduction in greenhouse gas and the energy efficiency of the building. Recognizing that both are, are very important. You can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by switching fuel 
but really we want to see better better buildings better building envelopes and and the point that uh, it that aligns with you know for us the best is the improved buildings for residents we know that we, we we've seen the studies early on and i believe uh, TAF, Toronto Atmospheric Fund, used to do some some good research in in uh, how we we're improving improving buildings, improves residents' health. You know, we see that connection, and that's a very big part of of the of the buildings that we're trying to produce in our in our programs. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so with that, I think we'll move forward to question two. Okay. Um, so recognizing that we all have very varied programs and we are unique, um, even though it sounds like we do service and provide a lot of similar supports, um, there is there are specific, I guess, elements that we're looking for in projects and willing to support and able to support. Um, and I thought we, this would be a good opportunity for the roundtable to discuss what is specific to your organization when you're looking at buildings, whether that be building size, location, age, administrative structure, um, affordability focus. Um, really, if you could spend a couple minutes just focusing people in, um, so that way attendees would know, you know, this is where, this is a program that I really should pay particular interest in, to um, and follow up with. So with that, I'll open the floor. I'm happy to go first on this. And uh, so uh, I think one of the, and this was also a question in the chat, so I probably think uh, it's a good place to address this. So the challenge with retrofits almost always is this. Most buildings need half a million, one million, two million dollars. Most lenders and investors want to give 10, 20, 30 million dollars in money. So the biggest challenge is mixing and matching this. So this is where someone like us come into play, my efficiency capital comes into play. What we do is we go and take capital in chunks. I um, mean, uh, there are talks about CIB programs, um, VCIB provides capital. We have a bunch of different uh, uh, investors who invest through us. I mean, we go to C uh, CMHC, we go to FCM in certain cases, we go to BBP, City of Toronto in some cases, we take loan from various sources and we go and deploy money in chunks. Um, so when we choose a building, we typically like to choose buildings which are typically over um, 15 years old because they have the maximum bank for the buck. And most buildings in Toronto are over 25 years old. Over 80% of the buildings in the Toronto GTA area, area, I'm talking of MERB buildings, are over 25 years old. Uh, so we, we, we tend to focus on that. And the other place is we, we don't work actually that much in the institutional space or the municipal buildings. We almost work exclusively with MERBs. Most of the 50 plus installations, 70% of the 50 plus installations have happened in MERBs, condos, co-ops, uh, and social housing. So this is typically our bread and butter. Um, and we also work with the commercial and the industrial buildings. And, and just to give you some quick statistic again, of the total energy consumed, less than 5% to 7% approximately is, uh, is um, consumed by what we call institutional buildings, which is basically the municipalities, utility, um, universities, schools, and hospitals segment. But 90% of these guaranteed energy saving mechanisms are, are the ESCO mechanisms happen in this particular segment, which means almost the, the entire uh, residential space, the commercial space, the industrial space has been ignored. So when we started our journey ten, like seven, eight years ago, we exclusively focused on these segments. So that's to give you a, a quick uh, answer to, to, uh, to, to the question. I'm happy to go next. Um, I Maybe it'll be helpful. Um, we have some eligibility criteria, so I'll start there and then maybe speak briefly also to how we evaluate projects. We got some, I got some questions about that related to that in the chat too. Um, but first from an eligibility perspective, um, we look at both the applicant and the project itself. Um, for the applicant, um, nonprofit housing providers, cooperatives, municipal housing corporations, and municipalities are eligible to apply, so private developers are not eligible for our program. 
For a project to be eligible, we have both an affordability requirement and an energy efficiency requirement for affordability. 30% uh, of the units must be at 80% of the median market rent. That's the same as co-investment, and we did that um, purposefully based on advice from uh, our advisory group of sector experts, just explaining that that would make stackability much easier, um, the less kind of differences that we have. And from an energy perspective, actually, similarly, we have the same entry point as the co-investment um, or parent renewal stream, so at least a 25% reduction in the energy use of the building. It's different for new builds, but since we're focused on retrofits, I will just uh, focus there. We evaluate all our projects kind of with three broad um, areas in mind. One is on impact. That's really getting that triple bottom line benefits type of, of look. Obviously the focus for us is the environmental impact, energy and GHG reductions are really important. Um, but we also look at the social and economic benefits with the environmental lens on it. So things like tenant comfort um, and health and well-being and affordability are pieces that we consider in that impact sphere. We look at implementation, so really strong project management and financials. And then we look at transformative potential. So that's looking at you know, is the project innovative? Is the project thinking about how lessons can be shared and replicated across the sector? So those are some of the pieces that we look at. We have an, um, an application guide on our website that has all of this information laid out pretty clearly for you. Um, in terms of the, the dollar amounts, we do have a maximum of $10 million. We don't have a minimum for capital projects specifically, but guidance we would typically give is, you know, if you're coming for less than $500,000 um, for a project, it's a lot of work for, for that kind of small amount. A question we get often as well is, do we do portfolio projects? Uh, we can, it would still need to be a maximum of $10 million. And each individual building within that portfolio would need to meet all of our eligibility criteria. Oh, I'll just build off Jen's message because, uh... She is aligned with us in many ways. Uh, when it comes to project size, we have a uh, we have a min uh, minimum size of five units. It must be greater than five units or greater, five affordable units. And um, we do we do look at uh, when we're looking at projects, we do priority score them. We do look at location, close to amenities. We want to we want the location to be where people will thrive. So that's very important. Um, and other than that, uh, oh, the uh, stakeholder agreements, we, we do require another level of government to commit to the project as well. So we are looking for agreements. We, as I mentioned, the partnership piece under co-investment, we do need another investor, uh, but we also need uh, a commitment from another level of government as well. On top of that, just one to add. Uh, for Van City, the most important factor for us is um, is project size, and this really builds on what Chandra was saying. In cases where projects are looking for less than three million, plus or minus a little bit, um, in in loan amount, um, it it is best to go through an aggregator like an efficiency capital. They can bundle projects and then come to us for larger loan facilities. Um, it's just the most uh, capital efficient way. Um, as far as building location, we operate across Canada. Um, and then the, the sort of size, age, um, uh, specific measures and savings, we would work alongside someone like Efficiency Capital to ensure that those are appropriate for the, for the amount of financing being put forward. Uh, we do look for what we would call meaningful and measurable GHG reductions, um, but remain fairly flexible in what that looks like given where the starting point of that building might be. Um, and so if you're, if you're doing more water retrofits, it may be a little more difficult to draw direct GHG um, parallel to that. Um, uh, but in most cases, we're working alongside someone like Efficiency Capital to, to evaluate the project and ensure that the, um, the economics and the energy savings and the GHG reductions are, are adequate and appropriate. Um, with that, I'll just uh, quickly add very basic factors or information about the city. Um, we do provide loan funding. Um, our major restriction is that we're only located or only supporting buildings located in the 416 area code. 
Um, we can support projects of smaller sizes. However, um, we really advocate for any project um, sub $250,000 to really source financing through um, other uh, areas um, just because of the significant amount of, of work um, and, and capacity that's required to enable a City of Toronto um, application. Um, so it's just not necessarily valuable enough uh, for the applicant, although we, we have had some unique smaller loans, um, especially when there's a significant amount of GHG savings opportunity. Um, so we really do encourage people to bring any project forward. Um, and the other key fact on the City of Toronto side is that we do have strict financial savings and business case requirements that need to be brought forward um, when considering any loan. So with that, I think we'll proceed to question number three. Um, we are very limited for time here. So I was told that our heart, we have a hard stop at 11.50. So I'm going to open this up to the panelists. This is actually what I think one of the best slides from this panel today. Um, and it really provides a guide to what programs are available from the different panelists today, um, how and where, when you can seek support from them, what support they offer. And I almost I'm looking at this, and to me, this is a reference document for the future. Um, so in the next couple of minutes, I would ask people just to be very brief, because we do also have some questions in the chat that I'd like to quickly address. Um, but please, um, if you want to just quickly discuss a little bit of your programs. OK, rather than uh, waiting, uh, I will just go in, and I'll be very brief. Uh, as you can see, we work through the entire value chain. Uh, if there are grants available, say from FCM or from uh, BBP or any of these people, we will go and obtain those grants and use that to upgrade uh, or do the studies. Typically, that's typically what how we how we work. Uh, so we don't uh, uh, end up always. We always try to end up using the lowest cost funds. But just to give you a quick idea, we provide full funding for every stage. We do not charge the client. We roll all the costs of studies and everything into the capital cost of the upgrade. I will move, move it on to the next person. Um, maybe I will just briefly highlight two, three things. Um, our funding is, is clearly stackable. It was designed specifically with the national housing strategy in mind, um, but it's stackable with municipal, provincial, private funding as well. Um, the second thing is probably should have put that regional energy coach program that I mentioned in that pre-project um, planning bit, but I didn't. So just to note that that capacity development opportunity is there. Um, and then the post-construction piece is something we haven't talked about, but um, energy monitoring systems are a real great opportunity to kind of maximize the all of the work that is done on the, in a energy efficient retrofit project. Our funding can support an energy monitoring system, for example, to really be able to do that well and then do commissioning or recommissioning as needed. Um, so just wanted to highlight that too. And yes, quickly, CMHC uh, does encourage stacking and allow stacking. And the more we look at it, the more, uh, the more investments and funds and people we have involved, the stronger the, uh, the project should be. I'll just briefly describe what is meant um, by these, these brief words here. So by can provide guidance, what I mean there is that um, we're happy to be engaged early in your process. We don't have funding uh, usually available at those first few stages, um, but we can speak with you to see what kind of funding will be available to help you build your case, um, uh, including providing preliminary financing terms. At that detailed energy assessment level, we do have possible granting available. Every year, Van City provides 30% of net profit back to the community in support of our mission. And so this is probably most appropriate for community housing or low-income housing projects. And then the capital financing, of course, that, that's for construction, but also that's a you know typically a long-term loan. So we'll move in to post-occupancy, uh, post-construction phase. Um, and we do provide loan monitoring uh, support through that, that phase. But in most cases, that's being provided through someone like an efficiency capital. It's probably worth noting as well that we, you know, through our um, uh, commercial real estate team, you could look at options, um, and this is where the early guidance might be helpful, options to include a retrofit within your commercial mortgage at the time of refinancing your mortgage. Okay. 
And uh, one question that I saw in the chat um, for the full panel, um, uh, you know, from the city of Toronto side, please visit our website, all the program details are there. Um, but I did notice a question um, about interest rates and we all are aware of the rising interest rate market. And if the panelists have a, a minute to discuss that and how we can work around that um, and what type of solutions there are or, or challenges and solutions and opportunities um, as we look at this shifting um, interest rate environment. Um, maybe one quick note from me as it comes to our program specifically. Um, you know, obviously we have a team that uh, does the kind of underwriting credit risk assessment and would factor that into a, a certain extent. Um, but I mentioned our terms are 10, 20, and 30 years. What I didn't mention is we will we lock in our interest rate at the contracting stage and don't change it. So there is some assurance for the entire term of your loan um, and certainty in terms of what that interest rate is going to, to look like. So that, you know, hopefully helps create some, some certainty um, in a rising interest rate environment. Same thing with us. Uh, we, uh, we, we work with providers like uh, um, FCM or CMHC or Van City or others. So we have underlying loans which are fixed. So we will have a fixed return expectation. So we don't change our uh, returns. In fact, we take a percentage of the savings uh, and we do not take price risk. I think that was one of the other questions. So we typically only take volume risks. We want to ensure that the equipment installed works and it works fine. So, um, and that's typically how we go about it. Yeah, so CMHC, we, we lock in our interest rate also, but it's a 10-year term, and then uh, you're eligible for a second 10-year term. So, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not as great as what, what Jen offered, but um, it does give you a decade of a fixed rate and a strategy for how, how you're going to handle the second decade in, in, the, uh, in this environment of uh, rising interest rates. So, uh, is about the best that I can we can do right now. Um, so certainly rates are going up. Um, if you have a project you've been sitting on, now's a good time to get started and uh, and lock in your financing. I think as you've heard, most most funding providers will provide fixed rates. Um, uh, we'll do the same. Um, typically rates are floating during construction and then fixed for five, 10, 15 years um, uh, once you reach commercial operation. And we can work with you to evaluate those options to look at is a five year, 10 year, 15 year fixed rate uh, the best solution. And I think also as, as the cost of capital goes up, it puts additional emphasis on working with the right provider to ensure you're stacking the right energy efficiency retrofit measures to drive the most value. I think that's really the most sensitive um, element in your sensitivity analysis around the, the things like payback and IRR. Um, it's it's the, the energy efficiency retrofit measures and, and probably a bit less so on the, the cost of capital. Hi, I quickly want to just jump in on one specific point. I, I know that uh, time, like the, the time is a constraint, but quickly to address one aspect of, uh, of like, you know, we have a 20 year program or a 20 year loan or a 20 year investment. We let our 